You know, I, I always start here uh, again. You were 18 years old back in 1975 when you're convicted of murder and rape. But before we get to that, just tell folks you're, you're in the Bronx, you're in New York. What kind of young man were you? What kind of teenager were you before all this happened? Who were you? I was pretty much into sports. I loved sports. I was a sports fanatic. I played baseball, basketball, football, you know, intramural stuff, no real big stuff. And I just was a kid growing up. I, I lost interest in school, so I really wasn't really paying attention to going back to school. But beside that, I was really doing nothing but playing sports. Right, living your life and just being a uh, just being a, a, a kid, young man. It. Yeah, I was a kid. That's it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So there is an eight-year-old girl named Karen Smith who is uh, found found uh, murdered uh, in in a stairwell uh, in 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 the Bronx. How are you even from what what I gathered? It was this crazy, and I keep hearing this over and over: false eyewitness testimony. But how are you even remotely associated? with uh, this, the, the killing of this eight-year-old child? I'm just a guy that grew up in the same area. I mean, I lived, I lived, in, I was raised, born and raised on 167th in Washington. I grew up there all my life and I moved only two blocks away to 169th, which happened to be in a tenement building, but the tenement building was around the corner from the projects where they live. So I was really living in the same area all my life. The, youth, the public school, 132, I played basketball there and grew up there, went to the public school there. So I was, I was familiar with the area I grew up. I was born and raised within a two block area of there. So I knew people on two, within two block area that we played sports together and, you know, just kids, just hanging out, playing sports together. Did you know this, uh, the, the victim, uh, Karen Smith? Did you know the victim? Personally, no, I did not really know her. I've seen her on coming and going occasions. I knew, I knew her brothers. I played sports with her brothers. So when I did see go, you know, see them, talk to them, if she was around, yeah, it was their sister, but I didn't, you know, talk to her and say I knew her like that. No, I didn't. Right. So there, there's no personal connection there whatsoever. No, I never knew so, Karen like that. So tell me what happens when you first begin to hear that you are a suspect in this child's murder? What's, how, how are you first beginning to hear this? I didn't know her by name. I, I just knew it was Keith and Kevin's sister. I never knew her name. I never said, oh, her name is Karen. I only learned that out through being arrested, you know, for the crime. So I didn't, I didn't know who, she, who they were talking about. And I just knew that I know that I had never did nothing to nobody. And how did you find out, like, how did you get arrested? Like, what, when does all this come to you? Like, oh, my, like, I'm being arrested for some crime? How, how do you, how does this even happen? It, 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 again, they just came to my apartment and where my mother and father lived. And they uh, just asked me to come to the police station because they want, they had a few questions they wanted to ask me. And didn't they tell you to wear the same outfit that you yeah. wore a couple days before? Explain that. Yes, the day before, I, my father had bought me an Easter outfit to wear for Easter. And the day before, he said, you know, you, you, it's, yours, it's yours, just don't get it dirty. So I decided to put it on and go out. And I went out and did my regular things that I do, hang out with my friends, probably, you know, shoot around in the park. Let me get the clothes dirty. And then that was the clothes I was wearing. So they was like, well, would you wear the same clothes that you wore yesterday? I was like, uh, yeah, they're right here. He was like, well, would you put them on and come to the police station? I did. I put them on and just got dressed. And like, I don't know what they're talking about. My mother and father was like, well, what are they? I said, I don't know. They just want me to put on the clothes that I had yesterday and then come down to the police station. And I went with them. Now, were you... Were you nervous? Were you scared? Were you thinking I should not go with the, these police or, or no. did you trust the police? I, I, I didn't have no problem. I never had a problem with police or anybody. I never did. I never did. So I had no, no reason to believe anything that just, I didn't even, they didn't even really give me an ideal of parable of what was going on. So I had no problems. I just didn't have no problems where I should have felt, well, let me call a lawyer or mom, dad. I mean, I, I didn't do anything to be in any trouble. Exactly. Exactly. So you, you, you get to the station. Uh, this is March of 1975. What happens? 
they log me in when I walk to the desk. Uh, this uh, is a guy we're taking in for questioning. I went into a, a room with the same three officers that came to the apartment and picked me up. And we started talking and they just was asking me, what did you do uh, the day before? And I, I was with this person, I was with that person. I went and played sports or uh, we went and picked up some bricks, you know, just to what I could remember. And then they was asking me about time. And I said, look, I didn't have the watch. I'm just gonna give you an idea of when I think it was. Well, what time? And if I was off by time, they kept making an issue of it. But you said, and they was like, just kept on questioning me. And I just sat there trying to do the best I could to answer the questions that I, that, that I was asked. And they, they read you your Miranda rights, but don't you go through hours and hours and hours of, of uh, interrogation? Is this correct? Just hours and hours of being interrogated and you're 18 years old? Over 10 hours. Over 10 hours. Over 10 hours. Yeah, and that one room just, they, they asked me, did you eat? What did you eat for last night? And I go, oh, I, I'm not sure of hamburgers, pork chops. And they would write it down. They go and look and they say, we came back. We didn't find no pork chop bones so that you didn't eat pork chops. And they just kept trying to jerk, jerk holes into everything I said. And that's how I spent over 10 hours. And, and for our audience, this wasn't even recorded. There is no audio of this interrogation. It wasn't even recorded. I guess they, they decided to not record it back then. Now, I may have read this wrong. I want to make sure I have this right. Uh, they said that you confessed, but you see a lot of false confessions when you're in, when you're in this hours and hours of interrogation. So did you technically confess or, or I, wasn't, I wanted to make sure I have that right because it, it was the interrogation. They, they kind of mix it up in your mind and they get you to say, then say this stuff because you want to get out. The, the, inter the, the interrogation was throughout the day them asking you what you ate, where you went, who you was with. That was the basic part of the interrogation. And then out of, you know, it's just like it came out of nowhere. One officer walked into the room and then he said his name was Detective Sergeant William Brent from the seventh homicide zone. And he was taking charge of the case. Would they leave the room so he could talk to me alone. Mm. They scooted out their chairs, left, closed the door, and me and him was in there talking. And at this point, are you thinking, wait a minute, something, something as crazy is going on? Are you getting afraid? Like, what, what, what are you thinking or feeling at this point? I was kind of more hoping that someone would come and give me an answer of really what was going on, because I really didn't know. I just know they were, they were questioning me about the same thing. Do you know Karen Smith? Do you, uh, you know, they were just questioning me about the, the knowledge of what I had pertaining or dealing with Karen Smith. And I said, well, I, I don't know who Karen Smith is. I did not know her by name. And what, what, tax, what tactics did they, did they use to get you to say that you were a part of this crime? Well, like I said, when he was along with me, he, he turned, he was talking to the wall, he had his back to me, I was sitting in the chair, I was leaning back on the wall, and he was saying, well, you've told all these officers everything, and it's the truth of what you said, and you haven't lied to nobody. I said, no, I told them the best that I know. Out of nowhere, he just turned around, and he kicked me out the chair. Physically kicked you out of the chair? He physically kicked me out the chair, and then right after that, I felt his knee with his weight in my chest. Because he wanted you to say you were a part of this crime. Yes. At, at that, that moment, at that, at that moment, I was scared to death. And that's when you said, I, I'm, I, I was said, a part of this crime. Whatever he wanted me to say, I said, I said. Hmm. I said today, if I had to go back to that moment and I knew that that could happen, I'd probably be dead because I would have not said anything and let him kill me if that was his intentions. I would have. Right. He, he basically tortured you. And I, live with that, I live with that scar every day and in fear. 
that I hope it never happens to me again or anybody else for that matter, because it's really easy to happen. It's so easy. Scare and fear can take over and God can tell you, you don't know what happened. You don't know. That's why it's so important for folks to be aware of the story because you're an 18 year old kid living your life in New York and they just come to your house. I mean, it's just such a, it's just, um, it, it's, it's a terrible a moment. It's a moment that, like I said, I followed a lot of other people's stories and um, into this wrongful conviction from whatever it may be, false identification, you know, DNA, everything. And I go, man, it, 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 when you really, like you said, you know, for everybody that viewed it, that get into it and really understand it, it can happen to anybody at any time. And, and if there's nothing to stop it, hey, it can be many victims like that people sitting in jail and uh, I got a friend now that I'm trying to help out and he's been in there 27 years same situation false identification and and when they don't they make a mistake they don't want to correct their mistakes and you have to be the one to pay for it and that's sad so sad. in July of 1976 uh there was a trial and uh they have this forced confession I think it's really important to say forced you're, you know, you're being assaulted by this police officer, you're in fear of your life. And there's this 10 year old uh, who allegedly says you were a part of this crime. What are you going through? What are you going through, Mr. Bryant, as you are in this trial and you're hearing this 10 year old, you know, this false confession is, is being used against you. What, what, what are you, what are you thinking? What, what, what are you going through? How are you reconciling all this in your head? You know, it's something I learned along the way, and I and I'm, I like to share it because it says it's a biblical saying. It says, "Know the truth, and the truth shall set you free." Mm. I knew that I had never done nothing to nobody, rape, murder. I'm not that proud. I was a kid. I had no no nothing intentions like that, and I knew that when it came to truth, that's all I had, and I knew that I didn't do it. And I knew that that confession was false. It wasn't true, you know? And I knew it was false because I was scared to death and I would do anything to live because I felt that my life was really in his hands and I was scared. And I had never been in that picture before ever in my life. I want to also say uh, that this was a brutal crime and there was a lot of blood at the crime scene. Your blood was nowhere on on the on the victim's clothes uh there was an examination of of the victim's clothes they found markers for type o blood present in both the blood and the body uh karen had type o blood the, the victim is the, the child named karen there was just nothing tying tying you to this except for this this 10 year old and who knows what what that child went through to 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 say that you were a part of this crime and these folks uh, out to get you so you deny, you testified and you denied any involvement. Uh, tell us about testifying at, at your own trial. I testify, the lawyer was telling me it was not good for me to testify, but I said, I'm gonna tell my version of what happened. If they let me, I wanna tell them what happened because I know I didn't kill nobody. I didn't rape nobody, I did nothing. I know that whatever that confession that he forced out of me was a forced confession. He beat me up, he scared me. And I said, I will tell you anything you want because I was scared to death. And that's just what happened to me. So I got on the stand and I told him that. I told him, I didn't do it. They questioned me and, you know, again, tried to mix up and throw all the different things. I just said, I'm going to tell you I didn't do it. And that was it. Was this a, was this a, this is a, a jury, a jury trial, correct? Yes, it was. Was, was it a diverse jury or was it an all white jury? No, it wasn't all, it was diverse because the foreman of the jury was a, he was from Jamaica. Mm. Wow. And were you hoping, were you thinking like, okay, there are people who look like me that are in this jury. Hopefully they could see through what's going on. Or did you already feel like this is done? They're going to, no. they're going to get me. I believe in one thing that maybe at no time I ever woke up in my life, like I said, know the truth and the truth will set you free. I knew the truth. 
I knew I didn't do anything to anybody. How long it would take, what prayer I got, I only had one thing that I could do. I did one thing in my life if I think I did right. When I was sentenced to 25 to life after I blew trial, I went back, I was on Rikers Island, I stripped totally naked and said, I'm gonna get on my knees and I'm gonna pray to God and say, God, you know what? <laughs> If there's some way you could see and prove that I didn't do this, please help me. And I used 42 years of my life for that moment. And here I am. And I thank God every minute that I'm here. Every minute. You know, I, I think about um I think about just the time, the time just being behind bars. And again, I want to thank you for sharing the story. It's really important for folks to know. Uh, you have your faith, but you were on Rikers Island. That's accurate? Right. Yeah. Yes, sir. That's one of the most violent prisons uh, in the country. How, how, how are you, uh, how are you, just how are you getting by just surviving? You're, you're, you're a kid, you're a teenager. How are you getting by behind those bars? Sure. Telling the truth. Just keep telling the same story over and over and over, telling the truth of what happened. That's all you got. You don't got nothing else. You don't have nothing else. You don't have nothing else. Were you be, I, I've heard people who have been wrongfully convicted of, of, of child crimes, they're treated pretty bad behind, with inmates and guards. Were you experiencing that? All day, every day all day, every day, for 42 years until they said, I am actually innocent, that halo stayed over my head. I also want to point out that uh, you were denied parole seven times because you refused to admit your guilt. And if you would have, if you would have said, I did it just to get out, uh, you might have gone out. That must have been so hard, Mr. Bryant, to... Uh, to, to stand by that? Was, was it difficult to do? Very difficult. But you know what? I, I go like this. If you really say to yourself somehow or another that for facts, you know, under your worst day, this could have never happened. I mean, what choices do you have? It's either fight and for whatever you got to tell the truth and hope that the truth prevails or you just die trying. You die, Troy. That's it. That's all you got. You don't got nose. You got no nose. So tell me about 2002, where you uh, are finally able to get the ball rolling and uh, <sighs> fight for your freedom. And do I have this right? Is it, is it a Centurion Ministries? Am I saying it right? You are saying it absolutely right. Tell me about Centurion Ministries and what they did for you. Oh, fuck. <laughs> oh, man. I tell you like this, and I make it very short and simple. If it wasn't for Centurion Ministries, I probably wouldn't be here talking to you. I'd probably still be in prison saying the same thing. Yeah, basically what they did is that they had your, uh, your uh, blood tested while you were in prison and they were able to prove that your blood was nowhere at the scene of, of this crime. Uh, sadly, there, was, there wasn't a lot of stuff left because the crime happens back in 1975 and this is 2002, but they showed that your type, it just, it wasn't compatible. Uh, so they fought to vacate, vacate your, uh, your uh, sentence. Now here's the part that's confusing to me. <laughs> uh, your sentence is eventually vacated in 2013 but you're in jail, you're behind bars for five more years. Explain how you don't, you're not released until 2018. Explain how this happens. <laughs> That's a weird one because when they re originally released me in 2013, we had asked to be on a 440 motion to have the federal court and the, the, the lower courts look at the actual innocence that he's actually innocent. And secondly, 
it was an ineffective assistance of the lawyer that didn't do his job correctly at trial because he had the evidence and everything in front of him, but he just didn't know what to do. It wasn't that he didn't do it. He didn't know what to do. So when they make the ruling, after they hear all of everything in the 440, the judge makes the ruling. And his ruling is, I release Mr. David Bryant on ROR on his own release and recognizance for ineffective assistance of counsel. That's the rule. So I'm and really- so how, how are you back in jail? I mean, why, why did it take five years for, for it to really officially happen? Because the district attorney through time had time to appeal. I was out, mm. but he decided to appeal. The ruling wasn't right. Oh, oh but let me, be, let me be clear. You are released in 2013, though, but it's yes, not vacated until 2018. I'm, I'm free. I'm free. I'm out. 2013. Got you. 4 11, 2013. I walk out the courtroom. Got you. All right? I'm out for 14 yeah, months. Gotcha. They appeal, but I'm out for 14 right. months. They win the appeal. They win their appeal. The district attorney appealed, and he was right. He was right. Unfortunately, it cost me what? To go back to jail again? Because here's how it all transpires. It's difficult, but it, just bear with me, and I'll try to explain it the best I can to you so you'll know. He appeals, they win the appeal. They win the appeal on this ground, that the judge made a bad ruling because he never ruled for actual innocent. He skipped over the actual innocent, but went to ineffective assistance of counsel and said, go home. Well, under New York State's law, you can't be released on ineffective assistance of counsel. You can get a new trial, but you cannot be released as a free man. So what happened to the ruling of the actual innocent? Well, they go back to the judge and they says, you got the rule on actual innocent. So he says, uh, I'm not sure because the two stir houses have two different opinions. So I don't know which one is right. With that, are you gonna rule actual innocent? He says, I really can't because I'm not sure. With that, they pull me back in prison and says, well, on ineffective assistance of counsel, you can't be free. So I go back to jail to fight now to prove that I am actually innocent. Wow. This and the four tough. years that I sat there was to prove that the sterologists and all that evidence, what was going to show that I was innocent was true. And then it went to the federal court for them to look at that. And they looked at it and Judge Sweet said, are you kidding me? He ruled everything in my favor under United States Supreme Court ruling to where there is no room to appeal unless you are right. Well, his ruling was he sent it back to the lower court, which was the Bronx, and said, you have two issues with this. One, you either find him, take him back to trial and prove that he is guilty of these charges, or you dismiss this case. Well, I got out again, bail hearing, never had a bail, but now all of a sudden I got a bail. And they let me out again on the same ruling from the first time in 2013. You're released on your own recognizance. Just report to court when your court date come up. And they took me like three times back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. till they finally said, Yana, we, we, we can't find no evidence, witnesses or anything in the case. And the judge had told him from the very beginning, look, this is a 42-year-old case. I don't even know if you can find anybody in 42 years to bring them back and find out anything. But if you can, now would be good. And he took his time, looked at me, finally came back and said, Your Honor, uh, it, it's just not possible. We, 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 can't, we can't find anything to do anything to show a new trial. So we're going to dismiss the indictment and the charges. And, and so the judge ruled, well, we're going to dismiss this case and we're going to seal the records where we don't have to come back to this case no more. So I'm a free man <laughs> today.
<laughs> 22 years later, saying the same thing. I know how to do it. I know how to do it. That's all I got. July 12, 2018, at 60 years old, you're a free man. Yeah. Yep. A free man. <laughs> free. Has, has the state of New York compensated you? Any kind of compensation for yes, taking away your freedom? For yes, they have. They, they have fined me, you know, like I said, you know, money will never bring back any of those moments, no matter what they give me. It will never bring back any of that. It's all gone. Uh, I can never get it back. All the things I probably could have did, I could have went back to school. I could have learned a thousand lessons that I didn't get a chance to do. I didn't get it. I just didn't get it. I was in jail. And uh, is your um, is your mother and father still with us? You mentioned them at the top of the show. <laughs> well, you know, I want to say this, and I, this is one thing I want to say when it comes to the issue of family. You know, I hear everybody all over the world, somebody somewhere got family, friends and everything. Well, I did a lot of years in prison being accused of something that was so heinous that friends were so scarce. I lost so many of the people that I didn't know. Family, they all died along the way. I have not one living family, relative, uncle, cousin, aunt. I've got a couple of friends that I met along the way in jail that believed that I was innocent and they stayed with me. I have one here now, but hey, that's all I got. I don't got nothing else. I don't know. How, how are you? Uh... How are you now? I mean, I, I can only imagine the trauma of being behind bars. Um, how are you? How are you healing? Uh, how are you getting by just emotionally, you know, spiritually, physically, mentally, everything? Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a moment that I don't even know if words can say it. I, I mean, I hear everything from post-traumatic stress disorder, from every moment that I went through and I go, I, I, thank, I thank God to be able to just have the ability to still be able to think straight, just think straight. I really do. I'm proud of that moment that I can think. I got my head on straight and I can think straight. Because everything else been a haze and, you know, hey, it's like being in a movie. You just don't believe that this is real. And then when you go through it all, you, you, you just you don't have an answer. You don't, it's no answer for it. It's, you just try to do the best you can do with what you have. That's all you have. You don't have nothing else. It's really simple, but you weren't left with a whole lot of options to do a lot of things, were you? Yeah. No. Uh, Mr. Bryant, what advice do you have for uh, a family who's going through this right now that they, they know somebody's behind bars, wrongfully behind bars, they don't have a lot of money, they can't fight it, they're in this system? What advice do you have for them? <laughs> I heard it once, and I'm going to use it, and I used it a billion times, and I'll probably use it another billion if I got life in me. I think Jesse Jackson told that story real easy for all of us. It's real simple. Keep hope alive. You'll never give up, man. You'll never give up. Never, ever give up. You always fight. It took me this long. I didn't give up. I didn't give up. I didn't give up. Because once you give up, there ain't no going back. There's no more going back. It's all you have. Never give up. It's always a will. There's a way. Especially when you know one thing, know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. If I'm going to be the example to live that, here I am. Here I am. Here I am. Yes, sir. Well, I want to thank you for sharing this story. It's so important for folks to be, you know, aware of what's, what's happening. Uh, from 1975 to things to the Central Park Five in New York to things that I'm sure are happening right now we don't even know about. 
Yeah. Uh, but it's so important. So I just want to thank you. I know it's got to be hard to just reflect back on this. And I, I'm really grateful that you just you spoke to us and shared your story of uh, now finally being exonerated. Is there I anything else you want to you want to leave the uh, audience with? So much. It's just so much. But I can only say one thing. And I do say this with genuine and sincerity from my heart. I appreciate every human being, every soul, color, creed, whoever you are, taking your moment and your time just to hear what I had to say. And I appreciate every one of you. I love you. I love you from my heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. My audience, we're all going to bring you up in prayer and bring you up in light. And uh, I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Clearly, I do. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful guy, and I do thank you for taking that time to give me some time. I appreciate you. Absolutely.